Body's Question, uh, the first published collection by current poet, poet laureate of the United States, Tracy K. Smith, coalesces around the poem Joy, which follows a woman through her final moments. Joy begins, imagining yourself a girl again, you ask me to prepare a simple meal of dumplings and kale. The body is memory. You were nine years old, playing hospital with your sisters. They've made the room dark and covered you with a quilt, though this is the South in summer. The poem's grammar tangles time. Are we hearing the stanza from the original day in the nine-year-old girl's life? Or is the day of recollection the hot one? Or both? Is the quilt merely part of a memory, or is that memory sparked by a patchwork that draped the subject's deathbed? Or both? Eating the kale, the subject of the poem links taste in all its immediacy to that same memory of the play hospital. The body occupies the point between the past and the future. At the same time, it's a point of departure for belief, for imagination. The first part of the poem, Joy, ends with the woman, who was probably Smith's mother, closing her eyes, listening to a dark chamber around a cord of light, Smith says. Then, Smith's voice. I know you are deciding that the body is a question. What do you believe in? On a day focused like today is on artistic consideration of the human body, it feels useful to meditate on the question Smith articulates, which isn't simply what do you believe in, but is more like what, given the body, can be. In Joy, Smith states clearest the idea that the body is a postulate, a basis upon which belief is built. Let's presume that our promotional material for this weekend is correct, that the story of American art is expanding and ever-changing. What does that have to do with the bodies of these artists and their subjects? Or with, for that matter, the bodies of our visitors? How do those bodies affect the way we tell stories with art? The sculptor Hiram Powers knew as well as Smith that the body was a point of departure. His, the Greek slave, pulls the viewer into a complex ideological and physical orbit, drawing us in and also maintaining a chaste distance, on the other hand, through different artistic devices. It starts from her face. We see the left shoulder just under it and follow the curl of her left arm around her body where her hand stops just at and in front of the groin. But Powers doesn't abandon us to voyeurism. Instead, the slave's left thumb guides us to the chain that locks her groin away from view and across it to her right hand. And there, her thumb flicks the eye down to a cross, which shames the gaze a little bit, while revealing the slave's soul, at least, to be unthreatened. All the while, we appraise the Greek slave while we orbit the plinth, rehearsing the movements of prospective buyers both of sculpture and of slaves. We've been coaxed by powers into a complex set of relationships, linking, among other things, the appreciation of art with the desire for human bodies, both as sex objects and as objects for sale. In our rehearsal of these movements, the dynamics at work empowers his display of his sculpture and in the sale of slaves come back to occupy through our footsteps a few moments of the present tense. What does it mean though for that past to ring through this body? Just behind the teeth of that question is the fact that I'm descended from people who were enslaved on Fort Mott Plantation in South Carolina. So I'm asking on the one hand a series of historical questions. What would the experience have been uh, for the few black people who might have been in the audience when this sculpture was first displayed? Or what might have been the experience for black audience members at a slave auction? How far have we come that my enjoyment of this sculpture now, generations removed, 
from the meatiest context for its interpretation is really no big deal. And how do you measure that? On the other hand, questions entangled with those arise, also historical, but immediate. How do I feel as I cir circle this sculpture? What does my experience evoke for me as a perceiver, perceiver of the Greek slave? Aesthetic concerns, sexual attraction? Is my background as the backsliding son of, and nephew and cousin of Baptist preachers? Uh, does that stir up any latent guilt in me when I perceive and puzzle over the riddle of sex, slavery, and Christianity posed by the sculpture? What is the function of my body in these explorations of works of art and of my identity? Body's question, uh, poetry collection that is, investigates the ways the body informs our construction of the self. Smith's claim that the body is memory is best made when she shows that its various functions are fully automatic. Smith's mother eats her dumplings and kale, for example, with tongue and teeth indifferent to her age, ignorant of who she is at all. The poem Bright has Smith herself wondering, with a mouthful of West Indian food, whether she and a European lover have met before, perhaps on opposite sides of the first encounter of Portuguese slavers with West Africans. The body's appetite for Smith, too. In her poems, desire seems to always bubble up beneath our surfaces, and we are differentiated by how we whet that appetite. Maybe we are indeed what we eat, in which case I personally am a burrito. <laughs> Clearly, identity as a function of the body's setting is informed by context. How am I feeling? What am I eating? Where am I? And works of art being part of that context can inform how we identify and what stories we author with and about our bodies. We can do this obvious, obviously with any work of art we've heard about today. Were we to encounter a miniature of the Greek slave, we might imagine how Frederick Douglass traveled with one, might feel with him the freedom in its heft, perhaps a little soreness at the end of the day as a bittersweet reminder. With both members of this club, we see ourselves in a ringside seat, staring up at two people fighting for money and respect. We can look at the strokes of paint on the fighter's side and see how their exhausted, slick bodies must have felt to the touch, or lunge like the one on the right to measure just how brief a moment Bellows is depicting. We might meet the eyes of Emily Motley, who gazes straight out from her nondescript space within the frame, and we might follow her eyes through the doorway where we can see the rump of Robert Gould Shaw's horse on St. Gaudens' memorial, marching south, funnily enough, through the galleries and toward the Civil War. We might smile to ourselves at Motley's location, safely on the wall to the north. We're here in part to celebrate the gallery's acquisition of Archibald Motley's painting of his grandmother, to celebrate the uh, important work being done by curators here, like Judith Brody, um, seen about acquisitions over the course of the gallery's history. The Motley acquisition is important for several reasons, but what I'm celebrating personally is the potential this painting gives us to tell new stories of American art. We can talk about the fact that Emily Motley was a formerly enslaved person and what that means. Shades of Douglas here, for an African American with that history at that time to be depicted in paint, and so well. It's crucial, though, that we talk about both how Emily Motley turns the other gallery women in white into white women in white, and what that means, and about how Motley herself was more than a formerly enslaved person. We should, in fairness to her grandson, discuss formal considerations in order to take him seriously as a skilled painter. I'm speaking broadly here, in part because Smith's original quote called me to do so. I know you are deciding that the body is a question. What do you believe in? Rereading the poem this week, I realized that for us, for the arts institution, the crucial bit is the decision. That when we choose works to acquire and when and how to display them, we are conveying our idea of what the body of the artist, of their subjects and of the visitor, 
can be or make possible in our galleries. We are and have always been a shaper of imagination, guiding how bodies move under this roof and what stories can be told with the art we collect. I'm not interested really in considering what the body as a question means for us. More important is taking it as a challenge to answer as openly as possible. What can we allow it to mean for our visitors? Three floors above us, there's an installation called Bodies of Work. I spend most of my time in the galleries there because it's where I'm most aware of time. On the right, uh, a few busts from Janine and Tony's Lick and Lather. On a good day, you can smell the chocolate from across the room. Bodies of work, because of the smells of Lick and Lather or the skin tones of Byron Kim's Synecdoche, bodies of work makes us aware of our bodies. We walk along the row of busts, and Tony licked the chocolate and washed with the soap, all of which were identical at first to each other and to her. We try to match our hands to bits of the epic poem that is Synecdoche and move along the wall to find the panels for people whose names we know, like Antoni or Glenn Ligon, who will be joining Antoni and Kim in conversation in just a bit. And like Amy Podmore, who was my drawing teacher in grad school. We pause before the stack by Felix Gonzalez Torres, a memorial to his lover, Ross, and now to him. And we decide if we'll take one sheet for ourselves now or later, and what we'll do with it after. Eventually, when the stack gets low, the gallery will replace it, and more visitors will have the chance to choose. We see Ligon's self-portraits. This is self-portrait eight. And think of his visual references. And then we get closer, sorry, Glenn, and closer, until our eyes vibrate with trying to reconcile these screen-printed dots into the man we think we know. There one more. And then we turn back to synecdoche and realize that identity is an activity, a putting together over time of disparate parts into a whole. In this gallery more than any other, here anyway, our identity is at play along with our bodies in the encounter with a work of art. Finally, we might approach the stack, officially named, untitled, Ross in LA. And notice that it's the only place where visitors' bodies make their mark on the art. These smudges down at the bottom of the screen there, along the sculpture's base, scuffs that people make with their shoes when they get too close to take a sheet, accidentally mark sheets that were never taken. Molly Donovan says that the stack is the first work of relational art in the collection, I imagine, that's because it's the one that presents a clear choice to the visitor. And so it's the only work in the collection that waits. But I imagine these scuffs as an image of the institution at large and how it's marked by the decisions it is and has not made in acquisitions, in storytelling, in hiring. They too represent the people who have left out, been left out of the stories we tell. All institutions are marked this way. We can erase them, we do that sometimes, or we can read them, learn from them, take them as a challenge to shuffle the deck, so to speak, and think, for us, for the visitor, what, given the body, can be. Thank you. <laughs>